Amen. Yeah, man, so grateful for what God continues to do in and through the lives of men here at Cross Point City Church. Amen. Because, look, when, when God changes men, everything changes. I mean, that's the truth, and I love stories like that where God just gets a hold of men, and then they're changed, and they start investing in the change of of, of the lives of other people. And so just kudos to all the dudes in the house who are investing in the next generation. And I just want to say, if you are a man still trying to find your place, our kids ministry or student ministry would love to have you. All right. So let us know if you're ready to take that step. But if you have a Bible, grab it, head to Colossians chapter four with me, if you will. Colossians chapter 4, and today we are closing out this series on the book of Colossians, which is, hopefully you know by now, is all about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk in our time about our need to live under his supremacy together. Uh, I told you this a few weeks ago, but Christianity is a team sport, y'all, all all right? It's like what we're here to do, this is not like playing golf. It's not like... It's not like you throwing the clubs in the back of the truck and you head to the course and you just play around by yourself. That is not what we're doing. What we're doing is more like playing football. That that we're suiting up and we're going to war and we are charging the gates of hell together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And what we see in our text is the reality of this and and how Paul closes out this letter. And I want to show it to you. We're going to pick it up in verse 7 and we will read all the way through verse 18. All right, here's what Paul writes. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who's one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they've been a comfort to me. And so Paul's just saying, those three guys that he named, these are the only Jewish men who are serving alongside of him in ministry. He keeps going, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I love that, man. Paul's just calling a dude out publicly. Tell this brother to get to work. I just love that. And then he closes it out with his own handwriting. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And so here's what we're seeing in these final verses. That Paul, the apostle Paul, was not a lone ranger Christian. Okay, Paul, listen to me. Paul was not out there doing life alone. Paul was not out there doing ministry alone. But Paul was part of a community. If I can say it this way, he had friends, okay? The apostle Paul had friends, friends who were serving him and praying for him and comforting him and encouraging him and doing ministry alongside of him. And some of these friends, as you just saw, were even serving the church at Colossae in many ways. And so what I want to do in our time is just point out some principles about friendship. I want to point out some principles about Christian community that we can glean from as, uh, as we look at Paul and these relationships that he shared with all these people. So I'm going to give you several things to write down if you're taking notes. All right, here's point number one. You were made for community. It's the first thing I need you to know that you were made for community. This is like bottom shelf Christianity 101 stuff. This goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible, page one, Genesis one. It's verse 26 of the first chapter of the Bible where God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I need you to pay close attention to the language. God does not say, let me make man in my image after my likeness. So instead of using singular pronouns, he uses plural pronouns. And it's believed by many scholars that this is a subtle reference to the Trinity. All right, the Trinity, if you're new to Christianity, it's a unique doctrine. Nobody believes this but us, all right? That as Christians, we believe in one God eternally expressed in three persons. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each of these persons carry distinct roles and responsibilities, but they all share in the same divine essence and nature, which makes them one God. And if you're thinking to yourself right now, James, that makes no sense. I don't think I can understand that. Congratulations, you are starting to grasp the Trinity, all right? I mean, it's hard stuff, isn't it? It it really is, and it's hard to get your mind around, but here's what you have to remember. You are a sinner with a tiny, finite brain, and you are trying to understand an infinite God, and at some point, it's just not gonna work, all right? At some point, your, your brain just can't handle all that he is, but here's the implication of Genesis 126. Listen closely. That before creation began, the three persons of the Trinity existed in perfect community. So think about that, before anything that was made was made, that the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, they shared in this perfect love relationship, and then God created you and me to share in that perfect love relationship, it's mind-blowing, but in addition, we've been created in the Imago Dei, the very image of God, and being created in the image of the triune God means that you and I were created with a need for community, and so if I can say it like we say it here at Cross Point all the time, we need each other, y'all. We need each other. Would you just look up here? I, I want to know that you're hearing me say this, okay? You were not made to walk through life alone. You weren't. You weren't designed to live in isolation. All right, you living in isolation, that would be like me trying to drive my truck through Lake Alatoona. Like, I can do it, but it ain't going to go well. Why? because trucks were not designed to drive through lakes. Are you tracking? That's what a boat does. That's not what a truck does. And can I just tell you, if you walk through life in isolation, it's not gonna go well for you because you were not designed by God to live that way. I'll prove it to you in a simple way, all right? Uh, Just last year, early in 2023, the U.S. Surgeon General called isolation and loneliness an epidemic here in the United States of America. He actually said that what we're experiencing in our society today in terms of isolation and loneliness, that it is harming both individual and societal health. Here's what the social, social research shows, that people who walk through life alone are at a 29% increased risk of heart disease, a 32% increased risk of stroke, a 50% increased risk of dementia, that their risk of developing depression more than doubles and their risk of premature death increases by 60%. I always think this is interesting when this happens, like when sociology finally catches up with theology. When sociologists are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. That this was, like, well, the Bible's taught this for like thousands of years, you know? And, and, and all that social researchers discovered is what we have known all along as Christians, that we as people were made for community. Now, let me stop and acknowledge, community can be risky. Can it? I know this is why some of y'all hate sermons like this. You're like, oh, great, I showed up on the community friendship day, you know, whatever. And, and, and you hate it because you've tried it and it didn't go well for you. You, you tried friendship, you got hurt. You tried Christian community and you got burned and somebody took advantage of you and you got offended and, and you know, whatever it may be. And so you're here listening and you're like, okay, great, here we go again. And I just want to acknowledge it can be risky and Paul knew it, yet he's still engaged in friendship. Here's what I mean, all right? There are two guys on the list that we just read who abandoned Paul at different points. Mark was one of those guys. We'll talk more about him here in just a few moments, but, but there's a story in the book of Acts where Mark took a mission trip with Paul and his cousin Barnabas, and in the middle of the mission trip, Mark was like, I'm going home. You ever known somebody like that? I grew, I grew up with a kid in the neighborhood, and we play ball in the yard, and anytime he was losing, he was like, I'm going home, and it drove me crazy, all right? This was Mark in the middle of the mission trip. He's like, I'm going home, and he just left Paul and Barnabas. And so mission trip two comes around and Barnabas comes to Paul and he's like, hey, I think we should invite Mark again. And Paul's like, not a chance, man. I'm, I'm, dude, I'm not taking that guy with us again just for him to quit on us again. And, and so there was this massive rift between Paul and Barnabas and Mark and, and what we know from the scriptures, we see it in our text, is that at some point reconciliation finally happened. At some point, these two brothers in Christ came back together and they're like, hey, Let's get our act together. I forgive you, I forgive you, and let's move on and praise God for that. But, but then there's a second guy on the list named Demas. And what we learn from 2 Timothy 4.10 
is that he abandoned Paul and he never returned. Okay, here's what Paul says, that he loved the world. You ever had somebody bail on you because they love the world more than they love Jesus? You ever had that kind of Christian friend? Like, okay, things are going well and we love each other and we're following the Lord together. And then they get up one day and they're just like, yeah, I think I'm done with this. I'm just gonna go back and, and, and follow the ways of the world and I'm gonna go do me and live my truth and whatever. And they walk out on you and, and there's never been reconciliation in that relationship because of the way that they're living their life. You ever, you ever been there? Okay, Paul experienced all of that yet he still prioritized community. He still had friends that he was doing life with and friends that he was doing ministry with. And so again, listen, community can be risky, but it is worth it. And I wanna give you three reasons to prove it, all right? Number one, you need community to image God rightly. You need community to image God rightly. I have already said this at at two other points in the series. I wanna say it again for a third time just to make sure that everybody's getting it, okay? To believe that you can follow Jesus without people is a dumb idea. We gotta stop believing dumb stuff like this. Well, I can follow Jesus and I don't need his church. Yes, you do, all right? I mean, let's again think about this logically. Page one of the Bible stuff. You and I have been created in the image of a triune God, a relational God for the very purpose of knowing him and making him known in his world. And so here's my question for you. How in the world are you going to make a relational God known by avoiding relationships? The point is you can't, you know? If Christianity is a team sport, then we need team players. Like you trying to image God in his world to fulfill that purpose all by yourself, that that would be like the athlete on the team trying to play every position by himself. Can you imagine if this weekend Kirk Cousins said to all the rest of the Atlanta Falcons, I got it. I got it. I'll play quarterback and wide receiver and O-line and and I'll get on the other side of the ball and I'll do kick. Can you imagine if that happened? We we would get destroyed, right? And, And the same is true spiritually. Like when you walk through life alone, you fail to fulfill your God given purpose because to image God rightly, we need each other. That that's number one. Number two, number two, why do we need community? to grow spiritually. You need community to grow spiritually. I believe, and maybe you'll disagree with me on this, but I truly believe this, that one of the greatest problems in the American church today is that the lie of individualism has crept in. I believe this is a massive problem. And and if you're not familiar, individualism is an ideology, it's very strong here in the United States of America, that values the individual over and above the community. In other words, individualism makes everything about you at the expense of us. And I think this is one of the reasons that our country is in the condition that it's in right now. Has anybody ever noticed that it's all about the individual here? Like, oh, oh, no, 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 I I just wanna be this way and live my truth and do my thing and everybody else needs to cater to me and just get over it. It's all about the individual over and above the community and one of the dangers is that I believe that lie has crept into the church and here's what happens when Christians buy this lie. We start to believe that we can grow spiritually apart from community. Here's often how it sounds. You know, I, I got my Bible, I got my worship music, I've got my prayer closet, I'm fine. And I just want to say, because I love you, you're not fine. You're not. Like you, you can grow spiritually on your own to a point, but at some point your spiritual growth will stop if you are not involved in God's church. Here's why. Because when God saved you, he saved you into his family. And just like your family shaped you, you know what I'm talking about? Like, like a lot of us are who we are today because of the family we grew up in. And that's positive and that's negative and that means all sorts of things for all sorts of people. But, but just like your family shaped you, God's desire is to use his family to shape you. That he saved you to be a part of his eternal family called the church. And listen, his church, this is the primary means by which he grows us into greater Christ-likeness. And so I need you to understand that if you try to follow Jesus apart from the family of God, at some point you will stop growing, all right? Now, let me give you number three. This is so important. Why do you need community? To resist your enemy. You need community to resist your enemy. The illustration, if you've been around Crosspoint, you've heard me use this 100 times, but the illustration I love comes right out of 1 Peter 5, 8, 
where Peter calls the devil a roaring lion. And if you've ever seen a a lion hunt, this roaring lion prowling around looking for someone to devour, if you've ever seen a lion hunt, this makes so much sense, okay? What a lion typically does not do is rush into the pack of zebras to take one out. But what a lion does is he hunkers down in the grass and he waits patiently for the one lone zebra with ADD to wander off from the pack. And then he goes after that one, right? And I'm just saying, man, if you're not in community with other believers, that's who you are. That's who you are. Like if you are the person walking through life alone and you have isolated in your, yourself in that way, you have put a big target on your back for the enemy. In his book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer speaks to this. This is such a powerful quote. He says, sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. And the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. Okay, listen closely. Here's the point Bonhoeffer's making. If you want to blow your life up, walk alone. If you want sin to overtake you, walk alone. If you want to do something really, really stupid that will devastate you and devastate others, Walk through life alone. Here's what you need to understand. That that big target that you put on your back for the enemy when you walk in isolation, oh man, he is more than willing to see that target and to take you up on your invitation to take you out. Here is the key to resisting him. Community. The key to resisting the enemy is community. Like you, in other words, have to prioritize walking in intimate relationship first and foremost with God But then you have to prioritize walking in relationship with the people of God because community provides safety. It does. Like, there's safety in numbers, y'all. You understand this, right? It's like, think back to when you were a kid and the bully showed up on the playground and then all your boys showed up with you and you're like, let's roll, man. Like, what do you want to do? And and there was safety in numbers, right? But when the bully showed up and it was just you and nobody else was around, well, then you were in trouble. Can I just say, when you walk through life with the people of God, and and I'm talking about people who truly know you. I'm not talking about surface level, superficial relationships where you just have the mask on and you're pretending that everything's okay when not everything's okay and you're hiding your baggage and you're not being honest. It's not what we're talking about, okay? But when you walk through life with people, the people of God who truly know you, the worst parts of who you are. They know the sin in your life that could take you out. They know what the enemy could use against you to bait you and destroy you. When you walk through life with people like that, the enemy has less of an opportunity to move in and to wreak havoc upon your life. All right, let me give you principle number two. Here we go. Number two, Christian community is unity in diversity. Christian community is unity in diversity, and and we'll unpack and make sense of that, but all right, let's have an honest moment. How many of you, when you read your Bible, you come to passages like the one we're looking at today, and you skip them because of all the names? Anybody ever do that? Yeah, you come, like, I'm not going to read that. That's a lot of names, and I don't even know how to say those names, and right? Yeah, I think we've all done it at times, and, and if I could encourage you as your pastor, I would just remember, all scripture is God breathed, so even the names are in there for a reason. And, and these names are in there for a reason, so, so don't skip the names. Here's what we learn from these names in our text. Listen, what we learn is that Paul had a very, very diverse group of friends. Man, this is so important, all right? These guys were not running together because they had so much in common. It's not like, oh, well, we live the same life, and we have the same backgrounds, and we like all the same teams, and we perform the same hobbies. It wasn't any of that. Paul had a very, very diverse group of friends, and I'll just show it to you, okay? In his friend group were Jews and Gentiles. And so think about it. Today, that would be like somebody having friends who grew up in church. I mean, they've been in church their whole life. They don't know life apart from church, and you know, they just grew up very religious, doing all the church stuff. You understand what I'm saying? And in their friend group are just like straight 
former pagan heathens. Man, they're new to this whole following Jesus thing. They're doing their best to figure it out. They're still including four-letter words and like every other sentence, you know. It's like they're just doing their best, you know, but, but they're in, you know. And, and this was Paul. It was like religious people, non-religious people. People who've been doing it all their lives and people who just started doing this Jesus thing, Jews and Gentiles. In his friend group was a doctor named Luke. Luke actually wrote two books in the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And then in addition to Luke, in his friend group was a runaway slave named Onesimus. There's a little book in the New Testament called Philemon. It's really short. You can probably read it in about five minutes. But Philemon is all about the story of, uh, Philemon is all about the story of Onesimus. He was from Colossae. And at some point decided, I don't want to do the job of slave anymore. And so he abandoned his master, this guy named Philemon. And at some point while he was on the run, he came to faith in Jesus Christ. And so what's going on here is that Paul is sending Onesimus back home to the city of Colossae. By the way, being a runaway slave, punishable by death in the Roman Empire. And Paul is sending Onesimus back to the city from which he came to his master. And did you catch the fact that in the text he called him a beloved brother? He's a beloved brother now. I'll keep going. In his friend group was this church planner named Epaphras. This was actually the guy who started the church in the city of Colossae. Epaphras, going all the way back to week one, he's the reason that Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae. Because he went to Paul in Rome, in jail, and he's like, hey, there's some false teachers coming in, and they're threatening the church. And so Paul wrote this letter in response to what Epaphras told him. But he he started the church in his hometown. And Epaphras, Paul even says, this dude is a prayer warrior, battling on behalf of these people, struggling to see them mature in their faith in Christ. But then in addition to Epaphras, you just have this like normal servant, this faithful minister, this guy named Tychicus. He's like Paul's errand boy, all right? Go get me coffee, Tychicus. Yes, sir, got it. Hey, take this letter to Colossae, Tychicus, got it. I mean, this is what he did. He just like helped and served and and outside of this, we don't know if he ever did anything great for the kingdom of God. He's just a faithful minister. I'll give you a couple more. There's a gospel writer in his friend group, in addition to Luke, this guy Mark, John Mark, who wrote Mark, the second book in the New Testament, Uh, John Mark was also the assistant to Peter, who was one of the apostles. And then in his friend group, you have this guy, Aristarchus, who was an inmate. He is in jail with Paul, probably for his faith in Jesus. But here again is the simple point. Listen, Paul had a very, very diverse group of friends, but they were a unified group of friends. Here's why. Jesus. Oh, man, they were different as night and day. Different backgrounds, different personalities, different makeups. They were being used by God in so many different ways. It was a very diverse group, but it was a unified group because of their faith in Jesus. And listen to me, y'all. That's the beauty of the church. That right there is the beauty of Christian community. That when you and I come to faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, our diversity doesn't disappear, but it now magnifies the unity that we share because of him. All right, let me show it to you. Just I'll use our church as the example. And I love having you do this as, as often as I can because it matters so much, all right? Play along, please. Would you just look around this room for a minute? Like for a look around. If you're looking at me, I'm a, like, just look, okay? Just look around. Because I want you to see. Don't forget about the people in the balcony. Look up at them too, okay? There you are. They're looking down at you. There, yeah, <laughs> balcony people, we love you. But, but here's, what I, here's what I want you to see. Do you see the diversity in this room? Do you see it? Do you see the diversity in age? Like we got some people with no wrinkles and they still got their same colored hair and then God bless some of us, it's very different, right? And yeah, <laughs> some of us still have our hair. Some of us, we, we don't know where it went. It's been gone for a long time and different ages. Uh, one of the things I love and our church continues to grow in this and I pray for more of it, different skin colors. I mean, the kingdom of God is a colorful kingdom, amen? Amen. And my prayer is that our church would be a true representation of the kingdom and our community. I love the fact that we can look around and see different skin colors, different ethnicities, different cultures. I mean, in this room, different socioeconomic levels, different family backgrounds. I mean, there's so many differences, right? I'll I'll just point out a couple of others. Do you know that we have Georgia and Alabama fans in our church? (laughs) Too soon? Too soon? Too soon? (laughs) Ah. The, 
The only thing that's worse than that is we have Florida Gator fans in our church, y'all. Like, yeah, I know. We go, we, we just, we're just praying they come to know Jesus, all right? But, <laughs> but, but, but listen, let, let me move past some of the surface level stuff because I want to speak to some deeper things. Okay, listen. You, you know, we got people here at Cross Point who grew up in the faith, and like this is all they've ever known is church and following Jesus. And then we got people in our church that have never known what this is like till they showed up here. Like for some reason, they showed up here and they had this life-changing encounter with Jesus and they're still just getting started in this thing. Do you know that here in our church, we have people, this is true for some of you, we got people who come from this long line of Jesus followers, like my mom and my grandma and my great grandma, and as far back as I can see, it was just Jesus followers, and then there are some of you who are a part of our church, First generation Christian. And God is using you to change future generations. I've told you, man, this is my story. This is my family story. I don't come from a long line of Jesus followers. I come from a long line of addicts and pornographers and adulterers and fighters. And that's my family line. And then God showed up in my dad's life in his 20s. And he's like, we're done with that. And Jesus saved my dad. And then all of a sudden, the direction of our family has been changed. God is using some of you for that. That's happening right here at Cross Point City Church. Do you know that we have people in our church that remain sexually pure until marriage? Like, praise God, we got weirdos in our church. They didn't even hold hands or kiss until the day they got married. It's crazy. And, and, and then, and then, and this is so good, and then, and we got people in our church that lived a long life of sexual promiscuity, just like devastated, and they're so ashamed, and God saved them out of that and removed all of that shame and guilt and condemnation. We got people in our church that have been saved out of the LGBTQ lifestyle, and we praise God for doing that, and we're praying for more of that. Listen to this. Do you know that we got people in our church that are recovering alcoholics and addicts? People who were enslaved to substances that wrecked and destroyed their lives. And at the same time, we got people in our church that have never even taken an over-the-counter medication. These are all the essential oil people, right? Like, oh, just <laughs> rub that on there and we praise God for you, man. I hope it's working, all right? But, <laughs> but listen, here's the point. Here's the point I'm making. Look, listen closely. Okay, here's the point. There is no good reason on a surface level, that we should be here right now together doing this, except for Jesus. That's it. He's the one. He's the one that brings us together, and it's our faith in him and our commitment to him that unites us. Jesus is the only answer for why this is happening right now. I read this quote to you back in our Gospel of John series, and, and I want to read it again. This is A.W. Tozer. It's from his book, The Pursuit of God. I love this illustration. He says, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. All right, here's the point that Tozer's making, that we cannot accomplish unity by human effort. It's impossible. Like the point of this sermon is not just get y'all riled up and like, all right, let's all work harder to do better at being unified. It's not how this works. Unity does not happen through human effort, which if I can just take a moment to offend some people, is why DEI programs are so ineffective. I mean, straight up, dude. Like, let's just be real about it. Like, these programs, I'm just saying the secular world has not figured out unity. We're the unity people. This is where we gotta help the world figure some things out, okay? And so what I would say to the secular world is this, man, you can do all the trainings you want, do all the programs you want, bring in all the speakers you want to highlight the importance of equality and inclusion all you want, and it will make absolutely no difference. Here's why. Because unity can't be forced onto people, it must be produced among people. Amen. Unity can't be forced onto people, 
It must be produced among people. And, and here's what you gotta know. Listen so closely. Unity is produced among people when people believe the gospel. It's like, okay, how, how, do, how do we strive for unity? How, how can we be unified? Here, here's how it happens. Sinners repent and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is where it starts. Man, I, all right, yeah, I'm gonna turn from a lifestyle of sin and I'm gonna follow Jesus as my savior and Lord and all of a sudden God adopts you into his family as a son or a daughter and then you begin striving by the power of the Holy Spirit each day to tune your life to Jesus. What does that mean? That you strive to bring every area of life under his lordship. It's not like I'm just gonna be Christian in name only, but it's like, oh, no, no, he will be Lord over me. He will rule as supreme, supreme over me. And when we do that as a church, like when we all live as the redeemed people that we are and we strive by the power of the Spirit to tune our lives to him in that way, this is when Jesus unifies us in our diversity. It can't be forced onto people. It has to be produced among people. And the Spirit of God produces it through the gospel and by us tuning our lives to him. Now, let me give you principle three. Y'all still with me? All right, principle number three. And this is why unity matters so, so much, so please don't check out, all right? Principle three, our unity gives the gospel credibility. Our unity gives the gospel credibility. All right, the night before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed for you and me. This is the high priestly prayer from John chapter 17. It's one of the most incredible chapters in the entire Bible. But Jesus is praying and in verses 20 and 21, he prays that you and I would be one as he and the Father are one. Here's his language. So that the world would believe God sent him. So let's just process this together, okay? When we go out into the world and we do what we've been called to do as Christians, which is to proclaim the good news of the gospel, right? We don't just come into rooms like this and this is where it stops. But we go out there and we announce to dying men and women you have sinned against God. The God who created you, you've offended him. You have lived in a, as a rebel in his world, and because of that, you're spiritually dead. You are an enemy of God under the wrath of God, and there's nothing you can do about it, but praise God he did something about it in and through his son, Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, out of his love for his world, he sent his son. And that Jesus came and he lived the life that none of us have lived, one of sinless perfection. Died the death we deserved in our place for our sins to restore us back to God. Resurrected from the dead to conquer sin, death, and hell for you and me. He ascended to heaven where right now he is ruling and reigning. And one day in the future he is returning to make all things new and to set all things right. And as sinful people, we can be a part of all of that. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, not a result of work. So, so listen. We get out there and we start telling people that. Here's Jesus' prayer. It's our unity our, sorry, that makes that good news more believable to an unbelieving world. Think about this. I gotta, like some of you are so share, scared to share the gospel because you're like, well, what if I don't know the answers? And what if I don't know the right thing to say? And what if I freeze up? Can, can I just free you up? It's okay at times to go, I don't know. I don't know. I'll get back to you. Let me go figure it out and I'll get back to you. But but I think at times we put too much pressure on ourselves. Like, oh, if people are gonna meet Jesus, I gotta have all the right answers, or I gotta know apologetics, or all of these things. And Jesus is going, no, it's about unity. It's about unity. That, that when my people walk in a spirit of unity, and when they live in oneness, and they love one another in the same way that they have been loved, all of a sudden, the gospel message becomes more believable to an unbelieving world. I want to give you a biblical example of this. A lot of you, if you're church people, you know this story, but if you're not, it's incredible. It comes right out of Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, this is all happening about 10 days after the ascension of Jesus. That he has called the disciples to go into the world to fulfill the great commission, to make disciples. And he's like, but don't go yet because you don't have the power you need. So he's like, I just want you to hang out in the city, and the Spirit is going to come, the Holy Spirit, and when he comes upon you, you will have power to be my witnesses, okay? So they're all hanging out. About 10 days go by. It is the day of Pentecost, and they're all gathered in this house together, and the Spirit of God comes, and he falls upon the disciples, and he fills the disciples, and we read that they all start speaking in these other tongues, these known languages, 
And all of these Jews who are in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, they start hearing the mighty works of God in their own native tongues. And they're asking, like, what, what does this mean? Some of the people think the disciples are drunk. I, I, they weren't paying attention clearly because I don't know any drunk people that can speak in languages they don't know, all right? Like, they're speaking in a language, but it ain't an understandable one. What does this mean? And then Peter stands up and he's like, I'll tell you what it means. And he preaches the gospel message that God sent his son and you killed him. But no problem because God raised him up from the dead and his name is the only name under heaven by which men must be saved. And if you call on his name and repent and believe and are baptized, that's what God will do. He will save you. And here's what's crazy. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved and baptized all in one day and the first mega church was born. And I, I just decided to throw that in there because I love that, man, that, <laughs> that the, early, the first century church was a mega church, man, and I love it because there are people in the world who have a big problem with big churches, and I'm just saying, man, just get over it. The first church was a really big church. And, but, but listen, anytime you have a big church, here's the trick. You have to find ways to make that big church feel small. This is why, just a quick side note, this is why here at Crosspoint we do groups. It's why we're on you all the time, man. You gotta find some people and you gotta find a place because if you don't find some people and you don't find a place, no one's gonna know you're here and you won't be discipled and you're gonna fall through the cracks. And so you gotta find some community. You gotta get connected and involved somewhere. And this is what was happening in the early church, okay? Acts 2 they start meeting in homes. So these 3,000 people disperse. They start meeting in homes. And in verse 42, we read that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship. So they hung out. They were friends. They actually liked each other. To the breaking of bread, which that's believed is a reference to communion, the gospel, just that reminder, and to prayer. Now, here's how crazy things got. Within the early church, people started selling off stuff to meet the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ. This is how committed they were to, to the church, okay? Now you had people in the early church looking around and like, you know what, I've got some stuff that I don't need and I know some people who have some needs, so I'll just sell off what I don't need to meet their needs. And so all of this was happening, this incredible culture of worship and generosity and, and care was taking root. And then what we read is that the Spirit of God is showing up in their midst and he's doing supernatural things. And here's verse 47, that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And I read that and I go, of course he did. Of course he did. Because come on, let's be honest, who in the world lives like that? I mean, who? Nobody, I know. I mean, nobody really lives like that, especially in our context. I think we'd all agree that here in the United States of America, we are a divided people, right? It's the divided states of America. This is who we are. It's crazy. I read an article just recently, and, and they polled some people. Eight out of 10 people agreed that as Americans, we are a divided people. It's like the only thing that we're united in is our agreement that we're divided. It's unreal, right? And, but, but listen to me. This is where we as the church have to be so different. Like those of us who bear the name of Jesus... This is where we have to be so countercultural. As followers of Jesus, we can't be a divided people. We have to be a devoted people. Like to, to say it another way, we have to be people like Paul and his friends. And we have to be people like the early church who would just be honest enough and humble enough to look at each other and go, dude, we have nothing in common. Dude, we don't even like the same stuff and the same teams and the same hobbies and we're different ages and man, you did church and I didn't do church and we have nothing in common except for Jesus and he's enough. All the, super, all the superficial stuff that so many people hang their hat on. We're not gonna hang our hat on that. Jesus is enough for us and because of him, what we're gonna do is despite all of our differences, we're just gonna devote ourselves to each other. Amen. And we're gonna devote ourselves to the word and to the gospel and to prayer. And we're gonna show up and serve each other and love each other and care for each other. And then we're gonna get on our faces and beg the spirit of God to move in power among us. And here's my question. Don't you think if we did that here, the gospel would become more believable to an unbelieving world out there? Yes, 
Don't, don't you think if we did that here that we would see the Lord adding to our numbers daily those who are being saved? I, I do, because that's the power of unity. Unity proves the truth of the message we proclaim that it gives the gospel credibility. So with all that in mind, I just want to challenge you in a few very practical things, okay? So if I haven't gotten in your business enough, I'm going to get in it just a little bit. Out of my love for you, okay? I love you. Just know that. All right, three, three quick things before we close. Number one, some of you need to take a step toward community. Some of you need to take a step toward community. And, and it's not because you showed up here and you heard me preach this message and you just feel bad. Some of you need to take a step because of what's at stake. Because of, of what's at stake for you individually, what's at stake for our church collectively. I mean, here's the reality for some of you. Um, you show up here every single week and, and you take up a seat and you worship with us. And can I just say, man, I, I love, I'm so glad you're here. Like seriously, man, I love that you show up and I love that you're here. And please keep coming and, and keep showing up. I love that you're here, okay? But, but here's the problem, you're anonymous. And that's one of the dangers of a big church is that people can come and just be anonymous. I think there's a lot of benefits to a big church. That's one of the dangers of a big church is I, I can just kind of sneak in and sit and not know anybody and then nobody knows me and I can just kind of be anonymous and do my thing and go home and nobody ever knows that I was there. And, and here's what I'll say. And I, man, I love you so much, okay? At some point, that has to change. There's too much at stake for you to live in isolation. Too much some point, the enemy's going to wreck your life. At some point, you're going to stop growing spiritually. You're going to miss out on the very purpose for which God created you, which is to put him on display in his world, and you need other people to do that. And so at some point, you've got to leave behind anonymity, and you have to take a step toward community. So if I can encourage you, man, come to our Next Steps class next month. Go on the website, join a group, go to the Next Steps area before you leave and talk to somebody about getting on a team. But some of you need to take a step. Number two, number two, some of you need to stop hiding out in community. Like I know what some of you are already thinking. You're like, oh, James, I've already done that. I'm, I'm, I'm in, man. I'm, I'm a part of community. I've got relationships. I'm in a group. I'm on a team. I've already done the thing. And again, I go, yeah, but not really. Come on, man, let, let's just be real. Some of you, here's what you're doing. You're showing up, but you're still hiding out. You walk into that crowded room every week, and all those people are there. Nobody knows you because you're putting on a mask, and you're pretending, and, and the fake you has walked through the door, right? This is why at men's discipleship on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights, our number one rule when we do table discussions is we're not going to bull crap each other. And if you're offended that I said bull crap, you just got to get over that, all right? Because I'm talking to men, all right? But seriously, that's a, we're, not, we're just not going to be those men. We're not going to come in and, and play games and hide out and act like everything's okay and we're not struggling. But we're going to come in and sit around these tables and bear our souls to one another. We're going to be vulnerable and transparent and we're just going to lay it all down so that we can grow and, and be the brothers in Christ that we need to be. But look, all of us have to do that. It can't just be the men in our church that are doing that. Praise God that our men are leading the way. But we all have to do that so that we can do in the world what we're meant to do, which is to put the beauty and supremacy of Jesus on display. And so let me just say before I move on, out of love, to all the fake people in the room, this week, here's your homework. Go to group and take off the mask. Walk in the room and be honest for maybe the first time in your life about who you really are. And here's the thing I love about our church. I promise you, you will be met with grace and with kindness. Promise, promise. Okay, stop hiding. And then finally, the third thing. Some of you need to be reconciled to someone in this community. Some of you need to be reconciled to someone in this community. I know in a church of our size, somebody is, is always going through something relationally. And so maybe somebody here has hurt you. Somebody here has offended you. Or maybe you are the person who has hurt or offended someone else. And here's what I want to say. All right, today is a great day for you to deal with that. What we're going to do, don't, don't move just yet. Just keep listening, okay? What we're going to do in a moment is take communion together. Don't, don't grab your cup. Just hang on. Just keep listening. We're going to take communion together. This forces us to deal 
with the issue of reconciliation. I mean, I talk about this every time we take this meal. This is a a very simple, beautiful meal. It's a family meal. And by it, we remember the sacrificial death of Jesus in our place for our sins. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 calls us to take this in a worthy manner, which means we have to examine ourselves and check our hearts and, and confess any unconfessed sin to the Lord. But do you know what it also means? That we've got to deal with issues with brothers and sisters in Christ. Because when we come to the table of the Lord and we remember what he has done to bring us into his family, we don't want to come to the table as a divided people. We want to come to the table as a united people. So here's just what I want to say to you, okay? And again, it's, it's, all, it's all me caring for you. If there's a broken relationship in your life that needs to be reconciled, and you can fix that in like the next five minutes, like maybe you showed up fighting with your spouse, and you're like, sorry, I was an idiot, please forgive me. Go ahead and take care of that, okay? Praise God, come to the table. But, but, but let me just say this. If there's a broken relationship in your life and you can't take care of it in the next five minutes, you might want to sit this out. You might just want to put this down and spend the next several minutes praying and going, God, help my heart to forgive. God, help me to let go of pride. Help me to confess what I need to confess, to own my part. And then you need to leave this gathering and reach out to that person. And you need to be reconciled to that brother or sister in Christ for the sake of the gospel. There's too much at stake for us to live as a divided people, all right? And so what I want to do right now is just give you some time to get your hearts ready for this. And so I'm, I'm going to just invite you to bow your heads in this moment. Believers in Christ, again, just check your hearts. Do business with the Lord, whatever you need to do. If you're someone who needs to do something with a relationship right now in this moment, you do that. And then I would say, if you're here with us and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you know, this, again, as I said a moment ago, is a family meal. So it's only meant for people who know him can't remember someone that you've never met. So I, I would say to you, you got two options. Number one, if you don't know Jesus, you can just put this communion cup aside and sit it out. And when we sing, you can join us. Or, or you can put your faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, and you can come eat and drink. And if you need to do that, like if, if there's just a sense in you right now, I need Jesus. I need him. I need him to be my Savior and my Lord. Then just tell him that right now in this moment in prayer and in faith. Just pray and, and say to him, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a savior, and it's you. Tell him, Jesus, I believe everything you did at the cross counts for me. That you died my death so that my sins could be forgiven and I could know God. And in this moment, confess him as Lord. Jesus, you are Lord over all things, and I need you to be Lord over my life. And just tell him, Jesus, I'm, I'm handing the reins of my life over to you right now. And for the rest of my days, I will follow you. Father, we thank you for this beautiful meal. And we pray that you would be honored and glorified as we partake. God, just be present with us, Lord. That's our prayer. If you're ready, you can get your cracker out in your hand. This is the Apostle Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. He says that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you just hold this up? Jesus, thank you for your body. We acknowledge that your body was broken for us. Thank you, Jesus, for suffering in our place. Jesus, we honor you and we glorify you tonight. And we thank you again for the sacrifice you made. We pray it in Jesus' name. Let's take and eat. You can open your juice cup. Paul goes on and he says, in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying... This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. Let's just thank him, Jesus. Thank you for shedding your blood so that we could be forgiven and know life. We know that our life is in your blood, that our forgiveness is only possible because you poured out blood. Jesus, we thank you for washing us clean in the sight of God. Let's take and drink. As we always do, we want to close out our time together with a song. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. And we want to sing this as our prayer tonight that, that Christ would be magnified through us as his people. And again, this is the opportunity we have as we walk in unity to magnify the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And so as we sing, man, let's make this our prayer.